Hello, everybody. I am here with Luke. Luke is taking his title back as my most frequent guest on the channel. Uh, this is your fourth appearance, I believe. Um, Bo Branson was previously tied with you uh, at three, but now now you are the uncontested leader again. Um, nice. Just to give a little bit of background, uh, well, do you want to introduce yourself just a little bit? Because I think I've gotten a lot of new listeners since the last time that we talked, and not everyone comes from the same uh, background that already knows who you are already. Oh, um, introducing myself. Well, being that I'm your m most frequent guest, this is what came to mind, and I just surpass Bo Branson again what that made me think of well then that means I'm clearly smarter than Bo Branson because whoever's your guest is the smartest right no I'm just kidding that's I'm sure that's not true um but I like love him as a guest so my um I am a stay-at-home dad from Minneapolis who um has a um who's very interested in ideas and theology and philosophy. Um, I always have been, and I've always been um, kind of a strange fit within uh, conservative Protestantism, is, which is where I've spent most of my life, evangelical world. Um, I call myself an evangelical mutt, and as our, our mutual friend Dave likes to say, I still am largely evangelical because, or Protestant because everyone in america is it's a protestant country so this gets into all the kind of tom just the, the history culturally we're protestants so no matter how you self-identify um everything is basically protestant in america but, but you go to eastern orthodox churches now yes yep mm -hmm. but but probably i don't even know how long it is ago now two three years ago i'm terrible at time also um i started my family and i started attending an orthodox church and that's where we still are um my kids have been baptized and are orthodox now i am still a catholic human because i'm just i don't taking my sweet time for various reasons but um have been loving it and so that's kind of the brief mm -hmm. thing of who i am mm -hmm. and but and your kids are are baptized in the church or some of them Yep. No, they're all baptized and they all mm -hmm. are, are all officially Orthodox now. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's great. And I probably will sometimes soon. Part of it was marital dynamics and things. My wife, it, my wife was raised Lutheran. And so it's a. Uh, hey, that's something we have in common. No. Uh, and her family's all like very, very Lutheran. Um, yeah, and no, that's, so, that's another. Yeah. My, my wife's family's all very, very Lutheran. Yeah. And so um, it's just, and part of it's our temperament and stuff. I think, I mean, she's on board with everything and gets it and all the time. But whenever we talk about conversations, I mean, I think she affirms and appreciates a lot about orthodoxy. She, we're just very different people and it's culturally very foreign to her for sure. Mm -hmm. Although there's so many touch points within Lutheranism, like once I became, because I wasn't raised in a high, so this is a slight aside, but I wasn't raised in a liturgical and Lutheran is kind of, I don't know. It's, if that it's a, high. it's almost the most liturgical of the Protestant denominations. Maybe Anglicanism is Anglican, more, right. but, but Lutheran's either first or second place on that spectrum. Right. So when I, so when we started dating and I would go to her church, that seemed weird to me, Yeah. but now, but now that I've been with an orthodoxy for so long, I remember the first time that I went back to her church after going to orthodoxy and I was like, Oh, I get all this. Like the, I see all these remnant touch points yeah, within yeah. orthodoxy. So that's kind of, so that's been fun, but, um, but it's, it's interesting. Like I joke with her because her family and my family, they're always just like, what are you? You're such a weirdo. You're just constantly, because everybody <laughs> I've changed so much within my adult life. You've had multiple life. transformations, right? Jordan Peterson yeah. was talking about that recently, <laughs> that people can go through only so many transformations and some people never do. You've gone yeah. through transformations. Yeah, for sure. And so then I joked with their dad once that I was, you know, because for a while I was young, restless and reformed. And in those camps, which we went to a church that was within. So this is the context. It was called Sovereign Grace Ministries, which is now a denomination. So it's like. C.J. Mahaney, Joshua Harris was prominent within that. He was like the 
the Paul to or the the um, Timothy to C.J. Mahaney Paul kind of within that church, and that was in the Young Resistance Reform Camp Gospel Coalition kind of those things. Uh, Acts twenty nine Mark Driscoll that world, mm-hmm. and then and to them Sovereign Grace before it was Sovereign Grace was called People of Destiny International, which if you want to name something that sounds like a cult, there you go. <laughs> People of um, Destiny. It, that all yeah. admits a little Gnostic. <laughs> international, yes. So, and they're and they're charismatic kind of, which isn't charismatic, now, young, restless, and reformed. Yep. Yeah. Curious. Which actually, Curious. which actually, most of those guys are. Like Piper is. Piper is. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought I thought he would have been a hard shed, hard edged cessationist, but maybe not. No, no, he's not. He's definitely. It's called continuationist now because it's all branding, but uh, he's definitely, he's thoroughly charismatic, uh, although it looks different because he's also Baptist. So there's a, so like they'll, you know, like they raise their hand and stuff and they'll worship, but it's pretty reserved. They're not like flying flags, mm-hmm. but theoretically they're open to it all. And um, so, so we went to that church and I think her family was just like, this is for sure a cult. Like, I don't know what this thing is. Um, and then, and now we're Orthodox and there's like, and they didn't know what that was either, but it, but it's old and it's ancient. And I said, yeah, who knows? I joke with her dad. I was just like, who knows? Like in a couple of years, I'll probably be Jewish. I mean, it's hard to tell, <laughs> which the Jacob fu- will love. I make no promises about my future self. <laughs> yeah. 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 You see, that's fine. I, I asked you to introduce yourself and I still learned uh, a couple things in that introduction that that I didn't know, like I didn't yeah. know that both of us had had Lutheran wives and in laws. Uh, that that's a, a commonality. A lot of Lutherans around. Yeah, is, is your wife from the Upper Midwest? Yeah, so we're both from South Dakota. You're originally, South Dakota. So she's, yeah. yeah, South yeah. Dakota German stock. Yeah, well, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's cool. Although we should probably stop talking about our wives on the internet. Um, That's true. <laughs> she um, would appreciate that. that. Uh, so, so let's hear. So, man, there's so many things that we could talk about. I think that you and I have had probably the most conversations on the Trinity just between us and trying to mm-hmm. understand each other. And I feel like each of us have kind of helped elucidate what each other think in certain ways, even if we might still have our disagreements. Um so did yeah, you which I didn't even know what those were. So interestingly in a conversation, that's what kind of led to this is I because you're better at articulating things than me. So I said, Sam, tell me how we agree and disagree on the Trinity. Mm-hmm. And you laid out like some five minute ish <laughs> audio. Uh which I was like inter- listening to was fascinating. So we could just do that again somewhat ex- because I almost thought it'd be really interesting to just like walk through that in a very Paul Vanderclay style. Yeah. Let's walk through that. And I, before we even do that, I think another thing is that we approach the question very differently. Right. And, mm-hmm. and that sometimes that can cause friction between us, but I think that also leaves open the op- the opportunity for, um, us giving each other insights and seeing things differently than is natural to either of us, right? And constructive conversation can can do that. Because, I, you know, like, I'm, you know, I, the, the phrase sola scriptura, I have mixed feelings about, right? You know, like, I, you know, in some ways, yes, I'm hardcore sola scriptura, but yet in other ways, I realize there's some certain paradoxes about it. And it's like, mm-hmm. It's not exactly, you know, how I would put it really. But I think yeah. what what I would say that is like, I have a really high view of revelation, I think. Yeah. It is what I, what, how I would describe it. And that's why I think that like sort of scriptural witness and, digging into history, especially the early history, because the hard part about Sola Scriptura, right, is then it's like, well, how do you interpret it, right? And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's just like this Pandora's box of infinite, you know, um, degrees of freedom in how you can interpret something. And then Mm -hmm. there's like, okay, well, then let's try and have the point of view of original authors and original audience and stuff like that, like as if there's some sort of pure perspective back there somewhere. 
And right. even that's tricky, right? Because there's just so many differences between the ancient, like, I don't know, between Paul of uh, Tarsus's worldview and ours. And some of those things like, you know, we can meet him so we can only meet him so far. Um, but still that idea that there was this kind of pure revelation that, you know, Jesus really did communicate things and not just propositionally, but in an embodied way to his followers, right? And then kind of there was, you know, revelations from heaven even after he's ascended, right? Even after he's in heaven, he's communicating with Paul. He's giving John the book of Revelation and, and those sorts of things. And there is something like a... Because I, I have some amount of distrust of even reason itself, like that, that's a probably a weird thing that you might not expect me to say, that, that I think that reasoning in human philosophy is very easy to go wrong with. And even intuition and sort of that sort of thing can go wrong, that really then, so what does that leave you? It leaves you with revelation as the way to get back to the truth. And I think really more than like a sola scriptura perspective, Really, what I care about is trying to understand as best we can what was revealed in Jesus and the early times of his apostles, if that makes sense. And and that's no, why I care so much about history. Absolutely, and it does. And that actually touches on a lot of the, the ideas that I think are all interrelated that we bandied about making this conversation about, which is like relational versus substance ontology. Um, e even the question of w what is revelation was a thought that I had when you were saying all that because, and how does revelation work? How does revelation manifest itself in the world? Um, it is an interesting thing because, because, and this is why, yeah, I agree that this conversation is going to be helpful and good because our best, you and I's best dynamic has always been Zoom face to face. We're better when yeah. we're doing this than text. Yes. We'd probably be really amazing in real life. <laughs> um, but um, because because that is the thing is how does revelation manifest itself? And all these things ultimately at the base of any discussion to me are um, assumptions about ontology and trinitarian theology really like it leads in all that what is the nature of revelation to me is a and how does it manifest itself to us is a is a trinitarian question mm -hmm. ultimately so yeah lead the way buddy let's do it all right so like in, in that recording that i sent you i think some things that we agree about right some things that we have commonality. Like, I feel like me talking with Bo Branson helped you kind of understand and articulate things that you had been intuiting for a while, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and and so the, the commonality there is that, like, God, in the one true God in some fundamental sense is the Father, right? Yep. Like, that, that is the God, right? We don't need to do some weird kind of, like, the God is this three and one, one and three, you know, kind of like, what does that mean? You know, so which of those is God? All of, is all of it God or each of those God? Yeah. How is that not three gods? One, you know, it's like that, that there's something about that that's just kind of this swirl of confusing propositions that seems yep. to, to get people off track. I think that we sort of agree about that. that yeah, and that's it, essentially monarchical trinitarianism versus yeah. an egalitarian trinitarianism which you even like even saying something to add to that that you that i've learned from you that i thought was really helpful is when people refer to this kind of what i what i often call like at a platitude level godhead well godhead is just a remnant of ancient language that just means godhood so it's mm -hmm. like godness it's yeah. like an adjective to describe to attribute to god it's like saying divine so there is no because if you would, again, ontologically, at like a metaphysical level, say, I believe in the Godhead, what does that mean? Well, what are you <laughs> talking about? That's like, like saying, that? And I yeah. think people know when they say that. They just say it because they have that's the Sunday school answer. They've been taught right. the Godhead, but they haven't really thought about what does that mean? 
Right, right. It's it's strange, like like what you just said. You know, like I'll repeat something that I think I said in a Paul Vanderclay Q and A, that that like in Middle English, like the word fatherhood. Right, you and I are fathers, yeah. and then fatherhood is the the quality or the adjective of being a yeah. father. Right. Yeah. And then brotherhood and, you know, the, all, all those words that end in hood in English, you take a noun, you add hood yeah. on the end of it, and then you turn it into sort of the abstract quality of the thing. Right. And originally yeah. in Middle English, that, that hood was pronounced more like heed or head or something like that. Yeah. And so God. OK, so there's there's God. What does it mean to be God? That's God hood or God head. Yeah. Right. Yep. But then that word now, it's it's what Trinitarians use to describe the plural thing. Right. Yeah. You know, yep. the, the, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are members of the Godhead. And it's almost like Godhead is when you're talking about the Trinity in a plural sense. And then God is when you're talking about the Trinity in a singular sense or, yeah, or something if, like that. If you, but if you break it down and, and you are referring to a plurality and but there's a godhead then it almost becomes like a quaternary where godhoodness is like yeah. this fourth thing yes of a, so like so the metaphysics matter and that's and like the and that doesn't work right and then really you fall into some kind of like i mean it, seemingly you could fall into some kind of modalism where then there's father son spirit underneath this godheadness yes. and really that's almost like a it's like a further extrapolated monarchical trinitarianism but in a quaternary form right you you have the mar you have the monarchy of the godhead <laughs> yes yeah but you right. don't have the monarchy of the father right cuz right. the, the father is now demoted into the same plane as right. as the son and the spirit or something like yep. that yeah yeah and then you need godhead head yes <laughs> so, so bring all that in a unit godhead hood <laughs> godhead hood yes yeah. So I think that you that you and I are, are in agreement on this. And like, you know, the passages that you and I would both like is no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, he makes him known or Jesus yes. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Right. You yeah. know, and like who, who's the invisible God? It's not the invisible Godhead. It's the invisible God, the father. Right. You know, yes. Yep. Yeah. And even mm -hmm. within so like within orthodoxy. So this is where I'll say within orthodoxy, I mean, we will say things like God, the son, mm -hmm. but you have to, but then the question is, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. When, when the orthodox say God, the son, they're talking about the image of the invisible God, mm -hmm. the manifestation of the invisible God. That's what they mean. They're saying God, the son, God manifest. They're right. not, they're not equating the two because that's heterodox. Mm hmm. And and so in this idea, like another thing that we both agree with is that like you can't see God in himself that right. is beyond our ability. That is it, it would destroy us to do so. We are not fit. Well, it's impossible. He doesn't yeah. have a body. Right. Right. So like, yes. Yeah. And so but we can see Jesus and yes. seeing Jesus is like seeing God. You can like look into Jesus to see God, but you're still looking at Jesus, right? And it's sort of the, the similar thing of looking at a picture to look at someone. You know, you're looking at a carved icon in an Orthodox church to see the deeper reality behind it. There's some sense in which it's like an approximation or some sense in which it's not the full thing itself, but in some sort of way, it kind of opens you up in like a portal sense to the thing that is representing. Yeah. So let me, so when you said this, I, I, I would phrase it differently and I want to know how you respond to that. So you said seeing Jesus is like seeing God. I would say seeing Jesus is seeing God, but I would still maintain everything I just said before. Right. And, and this is where And I guess what I'm saying where, by like is I'm I'm trying to re, re, refute or or head off the identity confusion. Like as yeah. if that seeing Jesus is that's God right there full stop, right? And that you aren't looking through Jesus to the invisible Father. Yeah. Well, and this is why we should probably 
maybe sometime in the future we can have Jacob on this conversation because this is where I think Trinitarian theology becomes very confusing and paradoxical because it, it's a paradox. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a conflation or a what's the word I'm looking for? What's it's not a par what's not what's the word that's not a paradox? It's just a, a contra contradiction. It's not a contradiction. Mm -hmm. It's it's a paradox. So Jesus is not is not God, but when you see see Jesus, you see God. You know, yes. like Jesus himself said that when you no one comes to the Father but by me, and when you see me, you see God. Like you think you know the Father, and through the Scriptures, you search the Scriptures every day because you think you're you're going to find God. But it's the Scriptures that tell about me, and I mm -hmm. and the Father are one. All of that stuff. Like I think it's it's what Peugeot meant. And I think this is what he was pointing out when he said the expression of the infinite is also infinite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that, yeah, I, I still would love to talk to Pejo about that sometime. And I'm like, there's part of me that's like, yeah, I can get on board with that. And there's this other parts of me that I'm like, eh. because because it has that distinction. The expression of the infinite is also infinite, right? You could just as easily say the expression of the God is also God, right? Yeah. And But so. you're using God in two different senses there, right? Just in the same way that he's using infinite in two different senses. The infinite is a noun. Infinite, the second time, is then an adjective, right? The expression yeah. of the infinite, that is God, God is the infinite, is also infinite. But it's not like the expression of the infinite is also the infinite, right? The, that That is important because you're using infinite, you're connecting them, right? But there is noun infinite, the source of infinity, the thing that is infinite. And then Jesus has the quality of infinity to him, but he's not the infinite. Yeah, this is where it gets hard. I don't, I don't know what, I mean, I understand what you're saying and, and the noun adjective distinction and, and not wanting to get into the problem of identity because it isn't that but this is where the Trinity gets really hard to talk about. So let me throw in some, if I may, throw in some uh, ideas of how I've started to think about it and language I've got on with it, which is interesting because it stems from, as far as I understand, Justin Martyr, and you just did this thing on Justin Martyr. And so, and I always pronounce this wrong, but is it Logi, Logoi? How do you say that? Log, 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 Logoi Spermatic, Logoi Spermaticoi. <laughs> Logoi spermaticoi. So, since again, like I just intuit everything, I don't read these people. So, you've read Justin Martyr. <laughs> and so, he talks about this idea, which I love, which I think is the original to him, somewhat at least the idea. And then it's repeated in other fathers. And I think it's in a Maximus. So, some things I'd like to bring in are energy and essence distinctions, which, mm -hmm. no, that's not Maximus, that's um, uh, Palamas. Yeah, uh, but Maximus I think also talks about this stuff, and then Justin Martyr's Logoi, Logi, Spur Logoi, Logoi. Logi, Logi is the bad Logi. guy in in um the Logi. Thor Loki, yeah. yeah, Logoi, yeah, Logos, <laughs> yeah, because that's how you turn like a singular into the plural, like Logos. Yeah. You get rid of the S and add an I, so it's logoi, like plural, plural logoses. Locus, lo, loci. <laughs> so I don't know, whatever. Like... I don't speak Greek. Okay. I, I um, often pretend that I can, I'm better at Greek than I really am, and I should stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's not, I don't, I don't pretend to be. Um, so there, so anyhow, but I like that idea because this is, let me try to lay out my general frame way of understanding it as i see it and see if it makes sense to you so i basically and this is and this will get into ontology stuff and relational ontology and what i what i like to call is the ontology of being there's also a book that i haven't dove into but i think it's called um communion of being which i think is about all this stuff too it's from an orthodox scholar um but what i basically see as god is the and Barfield used it all thrown a lot of different terms. But Barfield calls like the unrepresented or the unrepresentable that which is 
beyond representation because it's infinite, which this gets into a lot of things we've been talking about in our boxer thread. And then in order to make something not infinite and even, and even visible is to give it boundedness, which I, which I would almost equate to like being bodied. Something that isn't infinite is bodied and bounded, which is what allows you to see it because Peterson talks about this. Anytime you see anything, what it means to see is to not see in order Mm -hmm. to see anything you're not seeing stuff which is what consciousness is consciousness is the ability to focus on something it's salience it's a it's a popping forth a revelation of Mm -hmm. salience and a hierarchy that allows you to perceive something in spite of everything else yeah that's what it means to see Right. And in my work as, you know, uh, building predictive models and doing artificial intelligence and stuff like that, that it's just so true that yeah. what you're doing is focusing what, what, what predictive models are terrible at and what they really need the human for is telling it what to focus on. Right. Yeah. And and all all predictive models that are worth their salt. Right. All, some all models are false. I don't like what that what all models are false. Some are useful. I don't I don't like false isn't quite the right word. I feel like all models are approximations or something like that. All models are simplifications and some are useful. Right. Or, yeah, or, or you there's can bring a, in McGilchrist like all models, all models all models are models, all models are maps, but they're not the territory. All models are helpful when used properly, but mm-hmm. they are not the real. Right, because we're too constrained to take in the yeah. full real, right? That it would yeah. overwhelm us, right? Yeah. Most of, uh, you know, our, to fully open our eyes or something like that, we don't have enough neurons in our brains to, to do something well, it, like it, that. It, it would take all of the calories in the world to fuel yes. a brain that could see things that way. But we get away with only seeing what we need to see so that we can have a brain that's affordable, right? And yes. not starve to death. Yes. And why this is important is this gets into intrinsically Trinitarian theology to me, because that's God the Father, that's infinity, which is, and this is, and it translates to anything. You could, you could be, you could be a theoretical self-identified monistic materialist and and to me it's it's just as good to say the unrepresented infinite god is nothingness Mm -hmm. i mean you could say that fine what's the it's the same thing it's beyond duality infinity is there is no contrast it's beyond seeing it's beyond salience it's beyond hierarchy it's beyond everything which is why like apophatic theology so that's the full this gets into unity and multiplicity that mm-hmm. is full. God the Father is 100% unity. And this gets into energy essence stuff. That's pure essence. It's beyond description. It can only be described negatively. And then you get into multiplicity, which is the manifestation of the infinite, which, which and this is what iconography is all about, and everything is an icon, is it's representative of and, and bounded, but also simultaneously in a paradoxical way, infinite. And we know this. We all know this intuitively. Like you and I, we have maps and models and understanding of each other, of your spouse, of your kids, with which we operate and navigate you. But And Paul is famous for saying this. But if we treat you as if you are identical to that static mapping, people don't like it. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's the that's the infinity that is present within every representation of the infinite unrepresented. Mm -hmm. That's to me, that's just like, and to, and that's what I would call. And I don't know if Justin Martyr meant this, but I'm, I'm borrowing it from him. The, uh, logos from Atticus. Like that is the, this is why it gets into panentheism and panpsychism for me is like nothing. This is why we're not deists. Nothing has existence apart from God. Nothing exists on its own. It's impossible. What does that even mean? Because that's what I would argue. If we are not existing in God around Logi, around expressions of the infinite, how do we exist? By, by what mechanism are we existing? Mm-hmm. By ourselves. That's deism. That's not Trinitarian theology. That's, I don't even, you couldn't even make sense of it. Not only is it heterodox, I don't think you can make sense of it philosophically. So... 
let's see, I'm tempted to go in a whole bunch of different ways, but how about, so what, what do you mean by, when you're saying Trinitarian theology, I think you're saying it, you're meaning some, something much different than I think most people are talking okay. about. And I think you mean sort of like Trinitarian ontology or something like that. Unity and multiplicity. Yeah, so I, I think this is something I still need to understand you better on, because I'm not sure if I have this part of you very well mapped. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's what I was just saying. So, like, that there is some way in which everything is, is unified and connected, because how, how to say it? In order... No... In order to, I'm trying to get there through, this is why I like Barfield so much, and what I think his work is about is because it's about perceptions, which which to me are more fundamental than abstractions and ideas. This is why I'll say something like, it's deeper than ideas, and then something, and Nathan Orman, hashtag Nathan Orman, will, will just like says, you know, con, uh, pejoratively, it's deeper than ideas, man. You know, like I'm saying it like I'm some kind of, slippery postmodern you know woo master which i am <laughs> you know that's just that's trying to that's trying to just say things in a way that's like being fuzzy for fuzzy sake that's not what i'm trying to do mm -hmm. i'm trying to be really specific but it's hard to talk about things so um perception itself works and this is why it's good to talk about vision this is i was talking about this a little bit in the box this morning is this is why I think Jesus said, seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. I think fundamentally, Sherry and I have talked about this, all of us perceive reality the same way. I think it's um, a universal thing. The way that our perception works is the same. Where, where all the differences starts coming in, where all the dualisms and, and the antagonism starts coming in is in the mappings. And so we'll all, we all abstract our maps of how we perceive reality, and then we argue and we fall into dualistic thinking, because arguably conscious thinking is inherently dualistic. And then, and then we have all these conflicts. But, there, but I think within... But there is, that's not helping explain unity and multiplicity. It's connected. So, so what are the three things? So Trinitarian theology or Trinitarian ontology, I presume there's three things in here. What are the three things? Yeah, good question. Because you can maybe help me with this. I don't know how to, I don't quite know how to talk about the spirit really very well yet. So, so God is the, the ineffable bodiless pure spirit transcendent which is beyond category beyond expression beyond dualisms because nothing beyond being that that's mm -hmm. why i don't even like the category like when people say the ground of being depending on what you mean by that if you mean like the thing underneath and beyond being okay that's fine but that but like what is that it's it's inexpressible and so but in then, that way you're very neoplatonic and sort of this yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then that, anytime, because there is stuff, because we can see, because we exist, there is, there is necessarily, I think logically, an expression of the infinite, the unitive infinite that gives rise to, to, bounded, to bounded multiplicities, to bounded bodies, which is why there is something rather than nothing. And the nothing could be the same as God, like I said before, whatever, the nothingness that is God, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, singularity, the nothingness from which everything came. So, so then we have all the boundedness. What, so here's a question that might, spirit, I don't know. so here's a question that might help me understand you a little bit better. In what sense is Jesus unique? Because it seems like yeah. you could, a, a trouble that you might be getting into is that in some sense we're all infinite expressions of the infinite, right? Yes. And, and like so. anytime anything is bounded, it is a that, right? And so Jesus is just the name for the fact that everything is an expression of the infinite or something like that. 
or, or right, yeah. that that seems like a possible trouble that you have. Maybe that's what you mean. I don't think that's what you mean, though. No, I think it is. But th but I think this will be a helpful thing to talk to you about because this gets into I think where we are really similar, uh, somewhat in our understanding of Jesus and theosis and soteriology a little bit. I think we are actually pretty similar. So, oh, I see you're back on the Coke, you Western Easter people. Yeah, dude, Easter was last <laughs> Sunday. Lent's over. I've got my got my cherry oh. Coke. I'm back. I'm still, well, I drink coffee, but I'm still not back on the booze yet. So, um, I, not that I'd be drinking right now. <laughs> um, uh, it's morning for everyone who's, uh, but so how is Jesus special? How is he unique? So this gets into the... And how are we all not just little Jesuses who need to wake up to our Jesusness in some sort of uh, Richard Rohr-like kind of way? Well, I kind of <laughs> like that. So, so this is what I would say. is I mean, this is where it, things become... This is where things become really esoteric and complicated because I think this brings in time and kind of how I, how I at least posit that I would would argue to understand time <clears throat> to me to me jesus is the center of history so i wouldn't i would argue that one ought not to even see time as a linear progression starting back from creation to now but the center of history is jesus it's so much you could almost think of it as like a rock thrown into a this is all figurative a metaphorical well and symbolic rock to turn into a pond from which the ripples of everything else come out from. So it's almost like time is a sphere, three-dimensional sphere from which Jesus is the center of time. And I think that even the Bible will say things like this. This is a, it's a different way of construing time, but it's at the fullness of time. Yeah. Jesus appeared at the fullness of time. Right. The and land, and he's, the he's the, the... Of the world. And the mystery that the angels longed to look into has now been revealed yes. to us, right? That that sort of yep. idea, yeah, yeah. I'm yep, I'm fine. I'm fine with some version of that sort of thing. I think I'm so fine with I, saying that Jesus is the crux of history, and crux yes, is yeah. a good a good pun there. Yeah, absolutely. So what I would say is that everything that is is a manifestation, is an icon of God that. In him we live and move and have our being. This is where I would appeal to the the logosperms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's easier to say. <laughs> reason logos. seeds. Reason yeah. seeds. <laughs> reason seeds. But but reason reason is confusing because I think to us yeah. that brings in like that yeah. brings in an abstracted kind of logic rationality. It, I agree. I agree. Yeah, reason doesn't have quite the full connotations that Logos does. It's close, but right. it's not quite, yeah. Right. So everything exists as Logos seed, and I don't think anything has being without Logos seed. Rocks, atoms, quarks, this, is, this gets into substance versus relational ontology. Nothing has being in and of itself. There, there isn't some elemental substance or even spiritual platonic substance that has self-existence everything has its existence in relationality and i would argue relationality with god which is a coalescence of of a unitive whole around a logo mm. seed so so let me let me see a little bit how neoplatonic you are the Jesus question that didn't answer you didn't but, answer my particular we'll question no but but yeah <laughs> you said something i'm not sure what it had to do with my question but i still learned from it it was context. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so let me see how neoplatonic you are because this is something that that john verveke and i talked about recently yep yep um was this idea that some things last more than others, right? Some yep. things are more permanent than others, and that sort of what gives things their permanence is their formidness, right? And like, you know, an, an alligator that is more, and this was, I think, the example I used, an alligator that more closely resembles the form of an alligator will be better mm -hmm. at doing alligator things 
and it will survive because it's catching its fish well or whatever alligators do. Yeah. And then it'll have good alligator children who propagate the form of alligatorness. Whereas yeah, a deformed yeah. alligator is more likely to die and then decay and to stop being its alligator. Right. Yeah, and, this was or, your Gnostic evolution, right? So, right. Yeah. So yeah. sort of my connection between Neoplatonism and, and the theory of evolution. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and and that, but there, but to me, there's still like a scale, right? There's, you know, there's well-formed alligators and moderately formed alligators and deformed alligators, right? There's a hierarchy yep. of resembling the the proper yep. form of alligatorness, and the theory of the the mechanism of evolution is trying to constantly sort of like the, it's it's almost like there's this harsh wind of time and decay that blows at everything right that's trying to erode everything into formlessness but Heck the yeah. way the way to stay the way to fight the the wind of decay or something mm -hmm. like that is to resemble something that is permanent right and that the the th that the mechanism of evolution is like the the swimming upstream against the forces of decay so that you can more and more resemble something that can yeah. last. Yeah, so it's almost as if there is the ideal form and then the wind pushing toward decay from that. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is good theodicy stuff too, as far as I'm concerned. So the ideal form would be Jesus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the decay is the privation away from that ideal form. Yeah. And and I no, I think that's all good. The um And it's like if there is a form of human being, right? Jesus yeah. is the embodiment, you could even say incarnation, <laughs> where it's like we haven't seen the answer. Like evolution's trying to figure out the answer to what, what's a really good alligator, right? Um, you know, and it doesn't have a perfect answer. It has a good enough answer, but it's always getting a little bit better. Each generation, if everything goes correctly, gets maybe perhaps a, a, a small inch or two closer to the, uh, you know, the form of perfect alligators. And then those, you know, slightly better alligators beat their less good alligators, right? And, yeah. and, and in Jesus, it's like we got a sneak peek. We got a revelation yeah. of the yeah, answer yeah. Of, of that. And what's interesting yeah. is that that humans, you could put humans in a hierarchy above all the animals. It's not like we just got a, a sneak peek of, you know, one of the particular forms, right? We didn't get a sneak peek. It, Jesus didn't incarnate as an alligator, right? We still, it's not like we haven't seen the perfect alligator, but there's something about humanity in our image of Godness that is above all of them, right? Yes, right. And this this would And this is Jesus and all the forms can hold together in Jesus, right? So Jesus, yeah. yes, he's the perfect form of a human, but he's also kind of above all of the other ones. First fruits of all creation, maybe. And in thing in him all things hold together, right? Yes. And so I mean this is this is where this is where I would say at the end of the day, I don't even know that you and I really disagree about stuff. We're just working it out. And this gets into Oh, sometimes I feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and this gets into <clears throat> even becoming because so there's a few few thoughts that I had. Uh, one that I wanted to bring up was kind of the a couple things about Platonism, and I don't know how this contrasts with Neoplatonism. You would you would know this better, but I remember Nathan Jacobs bringing up the point once that, and this gets into the perception stuff too that all of us see. And I've talked about this recently in the Voxer. All of us see holes. That's what it means to see. You see unities. This is where perception is different than conscious articulation because in our modern post-enlightenment industrial age, we think we we so quickly map our models onto reality that you think you see you think you see sums of parts. You know, it's that Leonard Cohen anthem song where like you can add up the parts but you won't have the sum that's actually not how perception works that's how the analytical mind works especially in the post enlightenment consciousness but we see holes and nathan jacobs illustrates that in like if you go into a forest and you're just walking along and you see something like on the ground out of your periphery that that draws your attention and you because you don't know what it is it's something it's something out of out of normal so it draws your attention and then you look at it and then you're trying 
And then for a while, what, what you're trying to decipher what this is. Well, what you're doing is you're trying, you're saying, what form does this fit? You actually can't see it, mm -hmm. like truly see it. You can't actually perceive it until you know what it is. Right. And like and Jordan like Peterson a, will say that we have a lot more like cones and neurons in our eyes, like in the middle, like where we focus. Mm -hmm. And then as you go away to your peripheral vision, <laughs> right, you have less. Right. So yeah. like the idea that you're walking and then part of your brain is like, is that a snake on the ground? Right. right. And then the reason why you look is because you're bringing the more sensitive part of your perceptual mechanism to try and make a better judgment than your periphery can. But your periphery is there because you can't you know, you, there's what you're focusing on. But if you only can, if you only are looking at your focal point, you're going to miss the rest. But yet you can't have the same level of, you know, attention to everything that, you you know, right. there's there's a hierarchy of of how astute and, and fine your focus is. Right. And that so, yeah, the other that's seeing you don't see. That's what mm -hmm. it is. It's like you have to focus here. But then what you're doing is you're trying to fit. So then Nathan Jacobs said like something if it's like, let's say it's a. It's a old sweater that someone has dropped there and has gotten covered with moss and leaves and dirt and it's all crumpled up. Well, you can't until you know that's a sweater. You can't act. You don't actually see it. Mm -hmm. Once you know it's a sweater, then then you can. This gets into your form and the decay thing. Mm -hmm. Once you can relate it to that form, you can see it. But otherwise, you you don't actually see it. And this is where a modernist materialist that just thinks we see the world and it's full of objects and facts doesn't understand how perception works fundamentally you right. don't you like, don't just see that and say oh that's a crumpled sweater you have to you have to map that perception but mm -hmm. in order to even see right and and when you have young children right you you've raised kids and i've got a two and a half year old as my oldest right now and she's always asking what's that or and and why is that right like you know there are so many things that register on her anomaly radar right like when an adult walks through the world mm -hmm. you know most of it's already mapped so that it doesn't draw their attention anymore right because we are good at ignoring it right it's like oh that's a tree that's a car that's a crumpled up sweater on the ground. That's a pile of leaves, right? And stuff like we we because we have all of these perceptual categories already figured out pretty well. We we can just ignore so much. But a kid is like, oh my goodness, what's that? Like the th you know their anomaly detector is going off all the time because there's yep. so much stuff that they haven't learned to categorize yet. Yeah. Well, and this and this and that is a good touch point to to get into. Uh, iconic, what I call iconic vision, and yeah. even Douglas Harding, D. E. Harding, which has been coming up recently, is um, he has this wonderful video. I haven't um, Nate and James, uh, who's on the Discord, James Corditas, is that how you say his name? And Sherry have been reading through Douglas Harding's book that Paul talked. Paul went through the preface of C.S. Lewis earlier because he likes C.S. Lewis, but he hasn't talked about the rest of the book. Um, uh, hierarchy of heaven and earth maybe is what the name of the book but that so to get into that and an iconic vision so you're just talking about kids walking through the world and what's that what's that mapping <clears throat> the problem and this is what barfield i think was, t was trying to get at in his book um save um saving the appearance as a case study in idolatry is that you go through the world and you map all this stuff but the problem is is like if when you mapped it, all of those things become static and they lose their dynamism, they are no longer portals to the infinite. They are just static things that, that are essentially, it's a world full, of, Nate says this all the time, it's a world full of dead objects. And there's, and there's no, it's, it's not surprising that when, the, that when you begin to think and believe that it is a world full of dead objects that are portals to an infinite, inexpressible God, there's, there's, there's no, it's not surprising everybody falls into nihilism and depression, and suicide. You live in a dead world. I mean, C.S. Lewis in, in, in um, the Chronicles of Narnia, this is, that's charm. That's mm -hmm. the dead world. Everything's dead. 
And I suppose there's some part of it that's, that is a little bit inevitable. Like part of the reason why why we do that is like the same reason that we were talking about earlier. It's just too expensive to see everything all at once. <laughs> and that the more that you have mapped, the cheaper in a certain sense it is for you to be able to navigate to get your goals. And I think part of the part of what's happening is like you could almost connect it with like Rouse Doth, R- Ross Douthat's idea of like we're in a decadent society where it's like everything is so ordered already. Everything is so much as is you know, everything is so conformed to our expectations, partially because we've conquered so much and partially because we've shaped the world to be familiar to ourselves right when i'm walking yep. around my suburban neighborhood not very much is out of place right you know i can go on a walk in my neighborhood almost blindfolded because it's such a safe environment right yeah. and and like the the reason why you know but it's not safe for my daughter right because she might try and cross the street and get hit by a car or she might try and pick up something that's sharp Or she might try and, you know, interact with a dog that isn't safe. You know, like there's all these sorts of things that I as the father have to do to protect her because the environment's dangerous for her, but it's not dangerous for me. And and part of our world is so familiar that we're we're in way too much order and we don't have enough chaos. And that part of, you know, it's a healthy it's a healthy place to try and turn chaos into order. That's part of what being, you know, logoi spermaticoi things do. Right. Is is logos is sort of like the order. Right. And yeah. And stuff like that. And and that's part of the, the situation that we find ourselves in is that one of the reasons why things feel disenchanted, why things feel meaningless and stuff like that is we've got so much of it ordered that we can get so much of what we need with our current maps that we're never bumping up against frontiers anymore. Yeah, we've we've fully um, we have harvested the edges of the field. Mm-hmm. We've left mm-hmm. no fringe, as Peugeot likes to talk about, which is what that reminded me of is um, Cal and I love to talk about this. And this book changed my life. It's, it's one of the most profound things I've ever read. But Blood Meridian, but Judge Holden, who is the antagonist of that book um my favorite line from that book is he's this kind of mythical weird um character that's Jungian. he's also a djinn which i learned is apparently a um it's kind of like a shape-shifting uh spirit from the islamic tradition yeah jinn jinn is essentially the islamic word for like demon or something like that yeah but they're they're not they're not quite as necessarily evil as when we use the word demon but yeah right it's fuzzier it's the word for genie right like like genie in aladdin is a jinn okay yeah jinn genie yeah so that's cool um so he's essentially this weird character that you don't know who he is i mean he's very mythic he's like seven feet tall hairless stark white but he's this weird character he's also brilliant knows many different languages and he's constantly writing things in this journal it's set in like this it's set in like the late 1800s southwest and it's this brutal landscape and cormac mccarthy all his books are incredibly brutal but he's always writing in this book and he's surrounded by all these you know borderline illiterate cowboys that are just rough and killing everyone and scalping people and he is too but he's always nope just wait someone's knocking on my door <laughs> but he's always just like paul van Rick, like, except now it's not a homeless person it's my child they'll be homeless they knock again <laughs> um <clears throat> but um he's always writing this book and one one time one of the characters asked him what's he always writing in the book because he's he's putting in drawings he's taking notes and he's journaling and judge holden says something longer that's interesting he's brilliant so he says these poetic things and cormac mccarthy is such a brilliant person like i would love to just hang out with this guy um but he basically says i'm writing all this stuff down and he says because whatever exists without my knowledge exists without my consent Hmm. and i'm just like that line is like uh that's the modern west that's what we're like. That's what we're doing. We're trying to map everything so that we can, in Paul Vanderclay's words, ha- use our monarchical vision. This is what scientism and objectivism and rationalism is. 
so that we can fully harvest the fringe. But what will happen in a very yin yang way is in, in your over mapping and McGilchrist, your lopsided left brain, when, when the world becomes full of dead objects that you have mapped, you will create chaos. You will create an influx of the very thing you're trying to control and, and prohibit. And it's, and it's just a lack of wisdom. And so I guess what I would, what I would pause it, and this is what I mean by iconic vision is I'm not, everyone always thinks I'm like opposed to logic and articulation and rationality. I'm not, I'm against propositional ism, not propositions. I'm against not leaving a fringe. I'm against not leaving mystery. You know, Augustine, doctrine is a hedge around a mystery. When you lose the mystery, you've lost everything. And so what I would posit is there's a way to perceive the world that retains maps. It's fine to have maps, but but doesn't lose their iconicity. That doesn't lose there's a way to for our consciousness to be, and I think this is what Barfield was talking about with final participation, which he contrasted with original participation. Original participation was more like what Charles Taylor would call the poorest self that just was more of like a unity that saw the spirit. The world is infused with spiritism. It was animistic. Um, we are connected from all that stuff. There wasn't a buffered self where I am buffered from the world. But I think the further up and further in of final participation is reintegrating the world, reunifying the divided world that is just the static maps of dead objects and retaining that within our individuality because we now have this kind of autonomous individualism so we can we'll maintain our personhood mm -hmm. right but but yet but yet interact with the world in a mystical iconic sacramental way i mean i think that's what all of i mean that's kind of my i don't know proposition or that's my yeah and i think that connecting this back to like Jesus, the expression of the infinite and stuff, is that I think that you and I would both agree that part of the error of egalitarian Trinitarianism is putting Jesus as like the end in himself, or in some sort of sense, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking that seeing Jesus is God, like, and that's why I would like hesitate saying seeing Jesus is seeing God, right? Like, it's like, you're you're not recognizing that it's the portal that opens things up to something beyond it, right? You're thinking that it is the thing in itself, right? You're thinking that Jesus is God in himself or something like that, as opposed to the image of the invisible God, right? Because it's then it's it's almost as if you've put God in a Jesus box and that then, you know, you've got him completely bounded or something like that. Whereas Jesus... Well, you've mapped God, yeah. Yeah. I don't... So, I don't know. I don't know what to say to that. I mean, I understand your... I understand what you're arguing for, and I think <clears throat> there's merit to that sentiment, except that I would also just... My pushback would be... Um, would be, you know, no one comes to the Father but by me. And this is where I think in, I would argue because of the whole logo sperms, no one knows anything apart from Jesus. Those, mm -hmm. those are almost like it's a tautology. Yeah. To, to see or to know anything is to see it through Jesus. That's what it. That's or what to know it things means. properly, right? You can. And this is where yeah, you and I might disagree. Like, I think that there's error right and that there's off track and that there are bad maps and stuff like that and that's yeah. part of the reason why we're supposed to focus on jesus is because it helps refine that right yeah but this, this and this, that if you're looking for something if you're looking for it in something other than jesus then you're going to go astray and and but that's this sort gets into the difference between perception like what i was talking about before perception and articulation so conscious conscious articulation of what you think versus what you are and how you perceive things so i would again say we all perceive things the same way but then we so quickly map that so so i guess what i'm arguing is we all perceive things 
through Jesus, through Logos. I, that's what it means to perceive in my mm-hmm. frame. Like and, there isn't anything else. So anyone who is perceiving, anyone who is being is doing that through Jesus. I don't necessarily care that you propositionally acknowledge that. I mean, in the end, I think you will have to do because that's what it means to see fully. To see completely is to acknowledge that in its in its real, truthful reality in the articulated way. But if you are alive and you are being, you are participating in God. Like it's a tautology. Right. And so this circles back to the question that I asked that you didn't particularly answer is, yeah. is I, I sort of raised a possible objection or a question, whether it's like, are we all just mini Jesuses and we just need to wake up and see that and know that? And and that's sort of like, you know, kind of a, a new AG. And I, I mean that actually pretty precisely. Right. Like that's yeah. that that is quite specifically what a lot of new age people will teach and i think richard Rohr, to the extent that i understand him i will fully admit i've never read a full richard Rohr book i mainly read people who criticize him every once in a while i get most of my richard Rohr information from the impeccable source of Alyssa childers and uh (laughs) just trying to treat um uh so and honestly, there's something kind of true about that, that that I have watched one or two of her, her videos about Richard Rohr um, and that. But, but anyway, start um, with the precept, start with the assumption that he's wrong and a bad guy and then argue around to it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what could go wrong? But <laughs> but the but I do think that it is probably an accurate description of Richard Rohr that he thinks that we're trying to awaken to the Christ in all of us or something like yeah. that. Right. I don't even know that he would disagree with that statement if you right. asked. So I, I'm really not trying to straw man the guy. Um, yeah. I, I, so, but the thing that I would push back on that a little bit is like kind of relating this to the alligators thing. Mm-hmm. All of us are in some sense deformed. Total yeah. depravity. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, kind of, right? Right. I think that could actually be a healthy way of expressing that idea. You, you guys were kind of talking about in your um, "It's My Ontology and I Can Cry If I Want mm-hmm. To" video, which was mm-hmm. a hilarious name. If that was Jeff, I, I, I'm assuming that was Jeff. That was hilarious. I think it was originally Sherry's idea. Oh, okay. Well, credit to whoever gets the credit. Yeah. Uh, the hilarious name. But, but, you know, you're a deformed uh, human being. I'm a deformed human being. Paul Vanderclay is a deformed human being. Jordan Peterson, whoever you're, Elon Musk, right? They all have their imperfections. And if you make an idol out of them, right? If you think that you see the infinite, if you think that they are infinite expressions of the infinite, you will go wrong because yeah, you, you will be a... You will come to idolize their imperfections and not see their imperfections. And they're, and yeah. that's what it means. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. Right? And in Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. It's not that the fullness of God is in all of us and we just need to wake up to this super, you know, awesome revelation that, you know, hey, we're actually all, you know, uh, we're all mini Jesuses in some sense. And that's actually probably something somewhat close to what Jacob thinks in his sort of, uh, you know, panentheistic thing is that there's actually probably something close to, to Jacob's style Kabbalistic Judaism and Richard Rohrism. Whereas Christianity is like only, there's only one person who is the only begotten son of the father, who is the full image of the God, full image of the invisible God. Yeah. I mean, I don't, so I'll just riff on that and say kind of what I think. And I, I'm probably on the same page. So, um, I think that Jesus is the fullness or the perfect image of the invisible God who was made perfect by what he suffered also, which is something that we would agree on. Um, you know, I'll just can't hand proof text that right at you. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, and then he was, so this is within the Neoplatonic thing that I get, you know, that I've understood just slowly over time. And I think you and John Verveke, um, Dr. Verveke, bless you, um, 
had did a good job at explaining i mean you explained it i think but the cascade of being and neoplatonism is and it's also kind of fractal you know there are these lesser degrees and so jesus is is like at the head of that he's the fullness of that and he's the only he's the top of the visible perceivable spectrum of of the visible god because you can't get higher than that I mean, it's, there isn't a visible, perceivable expression of God beyond Jesus. That's it. Right. Like he's the top. He's and, the it's like, and, 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 and it's not like, and and it's not like some of it's in Jesus, some of it's in Abraham, some of it's in Muhammad. Right. Right. It's all of it's in Jesus, and only in Jesus is all of it. Yeah. And and any time that any of that is present and manifest and visible in anyone else, whether it be Abraham or Jacob or Muhammad or Gandhi or anything. That is that is an alignment to to Jesus. Yes. And so this is where sin and brokenness and my understanding of privation comes in is that we are all I mean, you could even bring um, the ladder of divine ascent. We are all somewhere along that ladder, that cascade from God, and we are ascending up that ladder. The hierarchy the of, of conformity to the Christ. icon of Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And so. Um, and so I don't, so to, to answer your question, are we all just like little Christ that are awakening to the Christ that is within us? Yeah. I mean, I, I think Tolstoy, even like the kingdom of God is within you. I think that is true. It, and this gets into like what you were talking about of perishability and imperishability earlier is, is that there is within us the the logo sperms within us in whom we live and move and have our being is imperishable. I mean, I think George MacDonald talked about this. This is readily present within Eastern Christianity. And this is where, this is where I really push against total depravity because total depravity can't make sense of this metaphysic. They can't make sense of an ontology of being like, what is humanity? This is what I tried to talk to Michael and Cal about in a total depravity Western frame. I don't think you can make sense of it. Like, how do we exist if we don't exist in God, if we're not coalesced around this Logos thing of which, yes, it's broken. Yes, it's down the ladder of divine ascent. Yes, it isn't fully now. This is what becoming is all about within time. And through, and I'll bring in John Bayer, and through suffering and through death, our seed falls into the ground and then comes forth and and bears fruit that is how mm. we actually become alive is through death and this was never plan b it was always plan a well i think that the death part might have been plan b because i think that it there's like the conceivable alternative of adam and eve not sinning Right, and this is, I'll borrow, I, like I got this idea from Dave. Um, I don't know if Dave made it up or not, but the, the sinless, the, the sinless theos, theosis distinction, right? You can be sinless, but not mm -hmm. fully theosified, right? If you are theosified, then you're in, maybe you sinned in the past, but you won't anymore. But you could be someone who is perhaps like a sinless human being like Adam and Eve, or some, you know, like in Orthodox and Catholicism, you could say the Virgin Mary, but she was mm -hmm. not yet perfected, right? How um, does he say that? He says that in a really succinct way, like Mary was... Sinless, but not But she divine, was sinless or... by... No, no, she was sinless by grace. Jesus was sinless by nature. Right, Is and that, that, yeah, and and yeah. that that's coming from just straight Orthodox theology that Jesus is divine by essence, and we become divine through grace, and that's yeah. actually honestly probably the part that I would disagree about, right? Mm -hmm. it is is that that I don't think that Jesus, f and this is this is how it, and this is where we'll probably part ways a little bit is how we understand incarnation. And what, to any extent, Jesus existed before his human, you know, birth or conception or whatever. Okay, what's our timestamp? When Luke, when Luke and Sam finally disagree, what time are we? <laughs> uh, it is, I think we've been talking for an hour and 12 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, not, maybe not okay. quite. And So incarnation. So you, you would say 
that Jesus was not divine by nature. Right. And that nor nor was Jesus like a conscious agent in the heavenlies who voluntarily decided to come down. Right. So here here's where I will agree with that, too. I mean, this is tell me if this makes sense to you. This is how I've started to think about it is. I think the technical Cal likes to talk about this. And then my friend Travis also has brought up this term. So it's apparently a thing within theology, but the logos of Sarkos, like mm-hmm. the pre-incarnate logos. I don't, I don't, I would, let me just say this. I'll posit this. I don't think that exists. And I mean that very technically with precision is that I don't think, I don't think anything that isn't incarnate exists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what's your view on angels? I think they are incarnate and that they have bounded bodies. They're just not material. They're they have spiritual physical. bodies. You would yep. say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could maybe uh, be okay with that. They're just sorry. Who's knocking? Children, don't stop knocking. You know you can't come in, naughty. Right. Okay. So I could agree with the idea that angels have bounded bodies, and mm-hmm. they are constrained in finitude. Yeah. And but they don't have material flesh bodies. They are right. a sarcos. Um, but they are not infinite. Oh, well, see, this is where I don't know Latin. Is that just what that? A, a, a sarcos means not fleshed, right? Sark sark is the Greek word for flesh, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I knew that. Okay, or well, I somehow, um, somewhat. And, and um, the word became flesh. The word became <clears throat> sarks. Right. So, so like even, I mean, you, you know, you could proof text that text of me and just be like, well, see. The, logos became flesh like that happened so like became in implies that was logos before flesh and and this gets into my whole weird time thing is i just i just take all of that all language to some extent i got in this with nate in the boxer a little bit about but is a because we were in this big free will debate about god choosing and i was saying god doesn't choose and like it's into bodies infinite whatever let's not go there free will debates they're kind of fun but they're also not fun because they go nowhere um i I just i like the word i feel like all free will debates could be fixed if we just use the word agency instead of free will and then all of a sudden it's a much clearer concept in people's heads but anyway that's hard for me too we should probably avoid that rabbit trail (laughs) right let's take that up in episode 300 um (laughs) of ours um so the logos sarcos i mean i get it i guess the logos not made flesh but even so then in my mind again with my ontology i almost god is the infinite unrepresented unbodied nothing mm-hmm. you know I, i'm just cause, because nothing or everything it's the same thing at that point it's beyond duality beyond being but but the logos is is almost like by definition the expression the manifestation of that so if you want to say so like logos almost necessarily is bodied it is icon the manifestation of the unrepresented eternally and this is where you could get into like it wasn't created it wasn't caused it has per se causation but not per accident you know it god is is logically prior but right. not temporally and- prior and, and that's where I would actually strangely agree with the Trinitarians against the Arians, right? Is that I do think that the Logos is co-eternal with God, right? As opposed to being a active creation, right? Okay, so how are you not Trinitarian then? So then because I, all of this we agree on. Right, so I think that Jesus, I think that the Logos Asarkos, to the extent that I would use that term, is conceptual or something like that right it's it's the form of right there's the form of alligator that is in some sense above the material realm but is acting upon the material realm in its selection among alligators right okay so and, here's where and I then there's the right and then there's the human version of that and as i already kind of mentioned it's not just humanity is one form among the animals we're like uh, above that in some sense but yeah. But that it's, it's a conceptual thing that has been, in a certain sense, 
a force in history, right? It's the thing that selects among men and which all the other forms held together. Yeah. But then Jesus embodies it, but there was no conscious yeah. thing that was Jesus before he was born. Okay, so this is <clears throat> to like archetype or something. This yeah. is where the conversation will become really esoteric and not valuable for almost anyone. <laughs> Wait a minute, we haven't been esoteric this whole time? <laughs> yeah, but we're going to get real esoteric. All right, well, only the hardcore people will have gotten this far, so proceed. Okay. Do concepts exist? Yeah, and so this is where I would say that in some sense, yes, but it, it is, I, I see, I think I in many ways agree with you that there's some sense in which their realness is embodied, but some sense yeah. in which it's not. And I would maybe say that I do think that they exist in some sort of eternal way that is outside of time and outside of materiality and outside of um, embodiedness, but that we only have access to it in an embodied way. Right. And and that might be a disagreement between us, but I think honestly we're still pretty close on that, right? Like we don't know anything in general. We only know things in particular. And to that I say yeah, yes. Start, keep quoting Orthodox priests, Sam. Yeah, I'm well, I, I'm quoting you. I thought that you were saying that. Is that Freeman? That's Father, Father Stephen Freeman. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to invite him on the show sometime. I hopefully we'll talk I would sometime. Love that. Um, I, well, I asked basically you guys, what Orthodox person should I have on next? And Sarah, whom I have a great deal of respect for, said him yeah. and everyone else yeah. seemed to nod along. So I'll take up that advice. He, he or Father Bear, but Father Bear. Father, Father Bear's Bear. already turned me down. Yeah, I'll get him eventually. Uh. I, I, I need to I, I need to work my climb my way up the ladder of of orthodox um, uh, ascent yeah. yeah before I get to him I I reached out to him too early I'll try again later um, so so what I was saying you, we don't know anything in general we only know things in particular right like yeah. language is just inherently particular right we yeah. make certain sounds like I'm calling the form of alligator alligator. Right. Not because like that's its name in the heavenly realm, but because those are the particular sounds that an English person uses to describe individual animals that they've seen in the swamps of Florida. Right. You know that, you know, I th it is related to my history and me as a person, the English language, you know, the geography of Florida and the Everglades. Right. You know, like that, that it's particular that I can even use the word alligator to try and think of the idea of an eternal alligator. <laughs> yeah. But there is still something, there is still, a, there is still, I think, the idea of the, the eternal alligator that is selecting among alligators that is in some sense above the material realm. And, and that's a very Neoplatonic thing to say. And I'll, I'll own my Neoplatonism by, by saying that. So here would be my question and push back a little bit and then... I'll, I'll expound on it, but isn't that Gnostic? No, I don't think it's Gnostic. I'll say it's Neoplatonic. And because, that... because if there's an alligator, if alligator-ness mm -hmm. exists outside of embodiment, I mean, even in an eternal, like in an, okay, let's say it exists in a non-physical way. So then do you mean a spiritual way or when you say it exists in an eternal thing? How does it exist? And I would say something like in the realm of forms, which is, I think that how do they exist. So the bodies. Is so the reason why. Body? So the reason why Justin Martyr uses the word logoi spermaticoi is that's coming from He was slightly earlier than the Neoplatonic tradition, but he's like what you would maybe call a middle Platonist, but I mean, that's just getting too deep in the weeds. But that comes from both kind of Platonism and Stoicism, that idea, right? He didn't make up the phrase logoi spermaticoi. That's a Stoic philosopher did. But the, the reason why it seeds is that there's seeds from the higher thing, right? There is, you know, the, the alligators have seeds of alligatorness, but there is one alligator form to rule them all. 
that is sort yeah, of up yeah. in the heavenly realm above all of the alligators and that all the alligators have logoi spermatikoi and various degrees of privation and deformedness on the form of alligator. Right. So, so in my frame, two things is that I would probably say that in order for something for alligator nest to exist in a platonic form, I would just say that that is a body. It's a it's a spiritual body of some kind because to me that's again that's like a tautology that's what bound for an alligator for us to see or conceive of an alligator because because that's the same thing as biological sight for us to see that intellectually is to not see other things so it's boundedness but it you could to, imagine that it you could imagine that there was a time in history when alligators were not and that the form of alligator was still undisturbed by that. Well, then, then I guess in the cascade of being, I would say that then that existed in. I mean, I don't know what you would say. It was. It so existed point, as I, potential, right? Right. Say in the, but that's also God, like infinite potential, or potentiality. But then the manifestation of that is always logos. Mm -hmm. And then, so I almost, so I almost think of it. Have you ever read the Cimmerillion? Um, I did, but I was too young to, to <laughs> okay. get it. So how I, so I would offer to anyone and the very beginning of the Cimmerillion, it's within the first, just read the first five pages. It's Tolkien's creation. Cosmology. Story. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's his story of creation for middle earth and, <clears throat> they, I don't even know all the, um, I forget all the names, but the Eastern realms and the whole world that, that the Lord of the Rings comes in and the Hobbit comes in. It's the creation story of all that. So there is, um, I, and I forget which of these are, there's a Luvatar and a Ru, um, which are like, I can't remember which is which, but Luvatar I think is, it's essentially got, it's all, it's Christian theology. But there's essentially one of them is God and one of them is the sun, I think, essentially more or less. But it's this creation story. And they and, and they I would suspect that he is monarchically Trinitarian, if it makes For the sure. least amount of sense. Yeah. For sure. And then um but he in their creation story, uh Iluvatar through Eru or something like that, I can't remember exactly how I could go get the book, but gives rise to um I think I believe they're the Valar which are essentially more or less the because there's all these realms even within Christ, christian theology these realms of angels and hierarchies and principalities and spirits and things and so he gives rise to these <clears throat> these it's essentially neoplatonism i mean it's just yeah, this cascade yeah. of angels and beings and spiritual but but all of that like those are all spiritual bodies and so in the way that i frame it to connect it back to the more concrete alligator if there is some form that alligators are um you know evolving and becoming into mm -hmm. that form in order this is this is why i kept pushing on the gnostic thing and i've been talking with preston about this and we've been talking about it in the boxer in order for that form to me for that form to exist it has to be a spiritual body Otherwise, so it's something it's like a principality, exist. right? There's like a yes. principality of alligatorness. Yeah. And that it in some sense is like a spirit. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, man. I'm, I'm really I'm at the edge of what I can. I'm at the edge of what I can articulate. But I think I see what you're saying. OK, um, me too. <laughs> that that it's something like what we mean by a principality where. Yeah. It, it needs embodiedness to be real in some sense, and it doesn't maybe have self-consciousness or self-awareness, this principality of alligator. And this is where ugh, this is where things are hard, because I feel like I well, feel perishability and perishability. Right. Because right. But they're in the Christian frame. The whole idea is that humans are made. I mean, Hebrews made or Jesus made a little bit for a little while lower than the angels. Mm -hmm. Then the ladder of divine ascent, and then he made himself. But to has now been, yeah. But mm -hmm. now is elevated up to the top, and through that, 
you know, the first fruits of all creation. And then he's bringing humanity with him in its fullness. Or it's like when he comes back down, he brings heaven with him, right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. Then, we, and then we in him bring up the rest of all of creation into its full alligator nest and yeah. iris nest and, and yeah. Kentucky bluegrass nest. Ooh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so here, here's where I'm, here's a distinction that I'm, I'm having. Like the, the principality of alligatorness is not like a self-aware spiritual being, but it has, but it, in like the Paul Vanderclay sense, it's real because it governs, right? It's having, it, it, it's having the force on the selection among the alligators and is shaping them into alligatorness. And you could almost say, and man, this is this is why I should talk about with uh, John Verveke next time. This this would be really good. Is like, in what sense does it have desires, right, and stuff like mm -hmm. that? Because there are angels that mm -hmm. have. I would say I think angels have free will, right? You know, the Lord of Spirits people will say that angels don't have free will. That's in, and and uh, I think Jacob might say that angels don't have free will. And mm. but but Justin Martyr and Irenaeus do say that angels have free will. So that seems like one of those questions that and we I, I don't want to go down the free will thing. We've already avoided that yeah, rabbit yeah. trail once. I'll avoid it. But it's something like they're a self-conscious being in their spiritual bodies. But I don't think that there's like the angel of alligatorness that is a self-conscious alligator being in the heavenlies or something like that. It's like an abstraction that is an impersonal abstraction, even though alligators are in some sense personal. But there are also things in the heavenlies that are personal, like angels. And I think really what I disagree with is mm -hmm. the idea that Jesus was a personal being in the way that angels are personal beings who then volunteer, who perhaps appeared in the Old Testament as like the fire in the bush or the person who Jacob wrestled with or whatever. Yeah. And then that that personal being voluntarily became flesh in the Virgin Mary. That is like the part that I don't think is right. I think that there's the abstract <laughs> Jesus as the logos of logoses, right? You know, but yeah. that it was according to God's will, it was made flesh, but it's not like Jesus remembers what it was like being a spiritual being before he was a human being. He's just a human being, but he is the perfect embodiment of the form of humanness and is the thing in which everything holds together. He is the crux of history. That's where I think I probably disagree with Orthodox theology. But see, I don't, yeah, well, I don't know that Orthodox theology is necessarily saying that. And this is where, like, John Bayer has that short YouTube video on what is a person. Yeah. Because, because I agree, you even said that, the logos of logos is. Um, Jesus the logos is the of logoi? Logoi? Yeah. logoi, yeah. Yeah. Jesus is at the top of that ladder, and whatever that, and again, this is where time becomes complicated because I, cause like I was saying, I think Jesus is the center of time. And so to think of an impersonal logos, an unfleshed logos of sarcos before Jesus in like this linear progression of time where there's this person, this agent, this bodied, albeit like was so, I mean, was there a spiritual body logos before the material body logos? I think I like know. Justin, like I think Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and a lot of them would say yes to something like that. Um, that that he basically was an angelic being in the heavenlies who had whatever kind of body angels have, perhaps an a, perhaps a higher right, like maybe in the hierarchy of angels, right? He he had like some sort of. He was like a god angel or something like that. He was unique in his godlikeness, but that he was still kind of embodied. And it seems like, like he's you know running around doing things and making decisions and obeying his father's will before he's a human being. You know that's how they seem to talk. And that part well, of it, that's the part that I, it's like it doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, I don't. I mean, to be blunt, I don't like that either. Um, I don't there's something about that that doesn't seem right to me because whatever 
and this gets into my panentheism and panpsychism, whatever exists in everything is, is the logos. And I don't, I don't think, see, God is the only unbodied, infinite, inexpressible, ultimate potential, everythingness beyond being and binaries, nothingness, everythingness. And then the expression of that is always bodied, almost like in a, in like a tautology. And, but, but none of those, but I don't think you can equate any, anything of that in an abstracted way or even in an embodied way to logos. It's just that logos is almost in like a Lutheran understanding of, um, uh, it's not transubstantiate, co-substantiation. Mm-hmm. The logos is in and under and behind and around and through. And in that way, you're All sort of, of and in that way, you're sort of Aristotelian, right? Aristotle would disagree with Plato that there's this realm of forms. The forms are just down here for Aristotle, right? They're 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 in in the stuff, albeit imperfectly. But there isn't some eternal realm of forms that it, it it's it's like down here. I don't know if that feels right to you. I would have to re- brush up on my Aristotle to not inaccurately yeah. describe him. But well, and I have to, I have to think about that because Nate, Nate Heil was, um, he was adamant in. So, Burn Power did this recent video on Gnosticism, and he had, and I had some. Uh, I don't know. There's some parts of it I didn't really like, and there were some parts that Nate really didn't like because he was saying what how Byrne was talking about Platonism and Plato is just not accurate. He said, it's just, that's not what Plato thought. I, yeah, so my... I think a lot of the ways that people talk about Plato and Platonism is apparently often inaccurate. So I don't know. Well, the weird thing about Neoplatonism <laughs> is people are disagree about how platonic it actually is or how mm. faithful to Plato, you could say, that by yeah. the time of Neoplatonism, it really was its own thing that was very indebted to Plato, but to say that you could, there's some gap between what it thought and what historical Plato thought, right? So then mm-hmm. when you're using the word platonic, are you using it to describe what historical Plato thought or what Neoplatonists thought like 700 yeah. years later? That's another thing that we forget is like by the time, you know, Neoplatonism is interacting with Christianity, that's like six, 700 years after Plato. That's a long time. You know, yeah, yeah. that's like the gap between us and Aquinas almost. Right. Which, yeah, right. <laughs> Which all that, um, like, is is the way that we talk about substance the same as, yeah. you know, Aquinas. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, those are the Aristotle Plato question is is tough for me. I mean, where I'm at now is I would say anything. What feels right to me is the is the only thing that is outside of the realm of agency and change and will and time and and everything is god and then within that i don't know this is the first time i've even thought about it and related it to co-substantiation because i don't like i i really don't like the idea of a bodied pre-incarnate logos i don't like that right I don't right know a spiritual don't even like a spiritual it. bodied one yeah i don't like it Mm-hmm. Um, because that that's too that's too creaturely for mm-hmm. me. That's not. I don't think that's right. I actually don't think that's orthodox. Um, that's interesting to say too creaturely, right? Because that is something. Yeah, but then it's like in in egalitarian Trinitarianism, like you can imagine that before zero BC or whenever you think Jesus was born. They thought it was possible to like go see. G- it's like Jesus was somewhere, right? He was up in the heavens, right? It, wherever the Trinity is in their, you know, schema. And and like I hear this so many times in song lyrics in modern evangelicalism and in sermons and stuff like that. That God be decide God came down to us, right? And this is a voluntary thing, and we're supposed to be moved emotionally by the idea that this super being would voluntarily take constraint and voluntarily empty himself and voluntarily be subject to all the ickiness of humanity, 
uh, you know, that he left heaven to come to us, right? And this is, there's something, there's a lot of emotional weight put on that, right? When, when, you hear, when you hear it talked about. And I don't think that's just unique to evangelicalism. I think that you could hear Bishop Barron saying yeah. similar stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I, I don't know as much about orthodoxy, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that. But that idea of this voluntary thing that a Godhead member <laughs> did for us is... Right. It is you know that's an important part for a lot of people's narrative and we've talked about philippians too right see previous uh, uh video that luke and i made on on philippians too and that's, well, that's where it's immediately coming to mind for me is like i was trying to recall you know the language of philippians too mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know it's it's weird i re i guess we should probably cut it close and i mean yeah. and that leaves a little meat on the bone for a future conversation i don't like i mean not that we need it but in particular for this for this topic is i don't like the idea of a bodied so so i would just posit the the axiom that the only thing that's unbodied is god everything else is body there's spiritual bodies there's material there's physical bodies um that gets into perishability imperishability i think they i would say anything that's bodied is in the world of change, but I think the rates of change are very different between those two things. C.S. Lewis talks about that a lot in Space Trilogy, actually. Um, and then, but the idea of a pre-incarnate bodied logos, I don't like. Right, because I I like the idea that it, it like starts at the bottom and then works its way up, it being Jesus, right? starts at the very lowliest of humanity being born in a manger etc and then is made perfect through what he suffered and then yeah. he gets resurrected like before like another part of this is like you know it, jesus has to die jesus dies and so he has to be capable of dying right, right? and so he's not immortal before he dies that's like that's tautologically true that's just nece you know jesus dies so he wasn't immortal, right? Does, yeah. I, if, if that's not true, then words don't mean anything anymore, right? Mm -hmm. But then he gets resurrected into a theosified, I would even, I can even use the word divine, human, right? And he then yeah. walks around, eats fish, you know, lets Doubting Thomas poke him, and then he ascends into heaven, right? And he is embodied he he can be in heaven embodied because he is a theosified being he's flesh yeah. in heaven which is weird right but the I idea what heaven is that he's yeah yeah he's in fleshed still he didn't like leave his human body behind it during the well, ascension he's, he's not he's not in fleshed i mean this is where we get, he's but he's embodied he's spiritual body well he he has he has divinized flesh Right. I think that that is an important Christian distinctive. And what prevents it from being Gnostic is that in our perfected state, we're still flesh. Right. There's this like new category. It's not like he turned into an angel, I don't think. Right. No, no. But there's something about it. Because Paul talks about this in First Corinthians 15, the resurrection. Yeah, Us it is a spiritual body. bodies. Right. And I think that that the point is, is that it is it is perfected flesh, right? It is both, it is but heaven and earth at the same time, right? When previously yeah. those two things yeah, had yeah. been separated, it's like yeah. he's heaven and earth at the same time in the same way that the new Jerusalem and the kingdom of heaven is on earth, right? So it's heaven and earth so, at the same time. Yes, let's, let's, let me say something and then let's cut it. We can, yeah, or, yeah, I mean, sure. You can respond to that or whatever. I'm not saying, give me the last word. Um, but, so Jesus is theosified. He has a spiritual but imperishable body. But then this idea came to mind as we were talking is he is also the first fruits of all creation. Yes. yes. Material and spiritual. So there's in some sense that Jesus is. So, I mean, we may he's think the beginning. Of, yeah. Yes. We may think of angels as imperishable spiritual bodies, but he is the first fruits of all creation. Yes. including angels so you mm -hmm. could almost say theoretically that jesus is the first imperishable being the first real thing yes 
Yes. And and he's the first real thing at his resurrection. Yes. Right. Which is and and this is you you and I talked about the weirdness of time and I'll, I'll wrap this up. But yeah, the the way in which Jesus is first is not that he was with God eternally before all ages as some sort of embodied God thing, um, yeah. but that he's first in the new creation sense. He's the first fruits over everything in the he's the first eternal embodied being. The new Adam. The new Adam. Yes. The the real spiritual Adam. Adam was a foreshadow of of Christ. Christ is like the real Adam. There's in some and, weird sense hey. in which Jesus is before Adam in terms of a definition yeah. of first, but he's after Adam in sequential time in a different sense. Yeah. I like it. I like it. All right. Okay. We solved it. We solved it. We don't disagree, it turns out. <laughs> I don't think so, really, <laughs> at the end of the day. So, I don't know. This is where um, I'll just close by saying this, that um, I definitely appreciate and value our friendship. I like this form of it the best. Um, I think you are, and I mean this you know, I'll plug your channel on your channel, but <laughs> which does no good. But and no one cares about what I think. I have zero status. I was gonna make a joke before about like you had me on a few more times and Berveke and John Bear will just come come on. <laughs> but um uh you are one of the best people I have ever met at having what I true communication real dialogue the opposite of what i call non-talking talking um you're you're a very uh oh damn i'll start crying you're a very um compassionate and empathetic and active listener and you're not trying to straw man you're you are almost never in what i call the egoic intellect i mean i've never gotten that feeling and intuition in talking with you and i've learned a lot from you through our friendship well, likewise, you've pushed me and hey, you've helped whatever status I have. A lot of it is from you. You got me on Preston Sprinkles podcast and, <laughs> and a whole bunch of other things. So uh, yeah. I, I, I agree and I look forward to meeting you in person sometime, hopefully maybe this summer. I almost I almost got a tear out after the crying episode. <laughs> You know, I cry sometimes too. Even even people with first percentile neuroticism will cry occasionally. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm such a the only Sherry and I are close. The only person that just puts me to shame is Jess. That guy's ridiculous. Yeah, that's like a true. slight breeze will make that guy cry. <laughs> yeah. And it's great. It's wonderful. And what's funny is my mom's that way, and I get it from her sometimes. Like every once in a while, it'll be like, "Oh, there's my mom in me." Oh, oh, there it is. You know, most of the time it's not, but then every once in a while, you know, a good Hallmark commercial or something, then boom. <laughs> oh man, it's great stuff. Yeah. All right. I was gonna keep talking. Cut it. Cut it. <laughs>